Today we wrap up our creation worship series by reflecting on the invisible element that Ralph Waldo Emerson described as the daily bread of the eyes, the ultimate art gallery above. The psalmist proclaims that the clouds are telling us the glory of God and the work of God's hands. And this morning, we'll focus on one special kind of cloud, the rainbow. The sign that God turned to create a sign of God's covenant of peace. But what is our role in this covenant that God made to care for creation? As you are able, please rise for our call to worship. Let us lift up our eyes and look to the heavens. We lift up our eyes to wonder at God's creation. Let us lift up our hearts and join with the skies. We lift up our hearts and proclaim God's magnificence. Let us lift up each other and share in infinite devotion. We lift up all of God's children and affirm God's boundless love. Please be seated. Just as when clouds become so full of moisture, rains fall upon the earth, cleansing it, when our hearts become full of knowledge of how we have fallen short of God's call to care for creation, we confess and experience a kind of cleansing. Please join me in this act of admission and cleansing. We marvel at what we've built. Our towers are like Babylon's, our technology. But all these things will pass away. We fill our time with distractions, our eyes with entertainment, our ears with noise. But it is the heavens that declare the glory of God. We pride ourselves on industry and productivity, but, but forget, forget to be still and know. We have contaminated our air in the name of progress, but, but, but we need the purity of elemental, elemental faith. faith. Friends, let the breath of God move through us. Our spirits are filled with the fresh wind of grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
Will the children please come up and join me on the chancel steps? Hi, Teddy. Hi, Oliver. Can you guys come over here on this side of the water and join me? Can you come over here, Oliver? Hi, Natalie. Come on up. And I think Henry will be with us in just a few minutes. Good morning. Mr. Teddy, how are you? Kind of happy to be up here with Mama. Was it a little hard to see her up here and that be way back there? Yeah. Good morning. So I invited you guys to join us to be part of the children's message because I'm thinking you're growing up so much that maybe you would like to come up and have some special time and learn a little bit about our Bible lesson together. What do you think? Would you like to do that? All right. All right, here's the catch. We have to be a little quiet until it's time to come up here. Can you think you can work on that a little bit? Because I know it's a little hard, isn't it? Especially when you're used to getting to play all this time, huh? But when we're done, you get to go play, okay? And have your story and your snack. But today, I brought a book to read to you. I had muffins this morning. You did, were they good? Oh my goodness, I should have been at your house for breakfast. That sounds yummy. Green apples, strawberries, and pineapple, and muffins. Ooh, I'm missing out. So I brought this book to read to you this morning, and do you know what it's called? It looked like spilt milk, and it's by a guy named Charles Shaw. Can you all see that okay? Sometimes it looked like spilt milk but it wasn't spilt milk, but it kind of looks like that, doesn't it? Did any of you ever spill your milk during dinner? You never did? Oh my goodness, Natalie, you're really good because I have. Have any of you spilled milk? Yeah, Henry, have you ever spilled your milk when you were eating dinner? No, you guys are good, wow. Okay, and did it look kind of like, like this, like just a big splat of stuff on the table? Maybe? So, sometimes it looked like a rabbit, but it wasn't a rabbit. I know somebody has a rabbit, don't you, Henry? Does that look like your rabbit? Does it? Sometimes it looked like a tree, but it wasn't a tree. Do you see that thing that looks like a tree there? Sometimes it looked like, what does that look like to you? An ice cream, an ice cream cone, but it wasn't an ice cream cone. That's kind of a bummer, isn't it? Because if you see an ice cream cone, don't you kind of want to get one? Yeah. Sometimes it looked like a, what does that one look like? What, Oliver? A muffin, maybe a mitten. a mitten. Right, we forgot about mittens because we haven't had to wear them for a while, have we? But not too far. Sometimes it looks like an angel, but it wasn't an angel. Doesn't that look a lot like all of you? Does that look, look like you, Teddy? Sometimes it looked like spilt milk, but it wasn't spilt milk. What do you think we're talking about in all these pictures? What does that look like, maybe? Where do you see something like that? Clouds. Oh, you are so smart. It looks like clouds in the sky, doesn't it? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Clouds in the sky. Have any of you ever just laid down on the ground and looked up at the sky and looked at the clouds? Isn't that fun? Did you have two, Natalie? And the blue sky. And the blue sky, yes. That's the best, isn't it? It is. They can be silly clouds, can't they? I brought you a picture of a really special kind of cloud today. Does anybody know what this is right here? What is that, Oliver? A rainbow. Yes, Natalie was whispering it, huh? It's a rainbow. How do you know that's a rainbow? Do you see all the colors in there? It's beautiful. Have any of you ever seen a rainbow in the sky? One time when I was with my grandma and grandpa, I did. Grandmas and grandpas seem to be the key to good stuff, huh? And you know what? 
God sent us this cloud in the sky that's called a rainbow to remind us to always take care of the earth. And so whenever you see a cloud in the sky, it's a reminder that God wants us to take care of the earth and that God is taking care of the earth and all of us. So when you see a rainbow, it's kind of like getting a hug from God. Isn't that pretty exciting? Think about that next time you see a rainbow. Will you think about maybe God's giving you a great big hug? And you can kind of just go like that, huh? Could you think we can pray together? I'm going to say the words, and then can you repeat them for me nice and loudly? Dear God, thank you for clouds that look like pictures in the sky. Thank you for hugs and rainbows, too. Amen. Would you like to go have snacks and stories with Miss Sue? Yeah. Do you want to come back and do this again next week? Yeah. Okay, I'll look forward to seeing you. Have fun. I'll see you after church, okay? Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Scholars believe that this morning's psalm is actually a composite of three different psalms, a creation hymn, a hymn of God's instruction, and the prayer of a servant. Together, they begin on a cosmic level and progressively narrow to conclude with the human heart. Listen to the worms, words of Psalms 19 uh, by... <laughs> Uh, that C.S. Lewis called the treasure trove of the Psalter. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the ferment proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There are no, wor there are no speech, there are only words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true, and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have domination over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Our Old Testament scripture this morning follows the story of Noah and the ark, an event that we have often turned into a sweet tale for children, but an occurrence that is really God's brutal act of genocide. In response to the atrocity, God made a covenant 
with all humanity, symbolized in a rainbow cloud, to always seek to reassure us to the right relationship with God and one another. Listen to these words from the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every, every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, O God, our rock and our redeemer. In her iconic song, Both Sides Now, singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell describes clouds this way. Rows and rows of angel hair, and ice cream castles in the air, and feather canyons everywhere. I've looked at clouds that way. But now they only block the sun. They rain and snow on everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in my way. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down, and still somehow, it's clouds illusions I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. I think that many Clevelanders, my husband most definitely included, don't know clouds very well. They tend to view cloudy days as dull and dreary, days that can get you down. That's kind of a shame when you live in a city like Cleveland where we have an average of 202 days of heavy cloud cover. That's a whole lot of days to be feeling down, my friends. That equals 55% of our time, making us among the top eight cloudiest cities in the country. But since we can't change that reality, and I hope that you won't all decide to move away to someplace more sunny, what if we decided to see clouds differently? What if, as Mitchell suggests, we look at clouds from both sides and marvel at the subtle, unpredictable variations in them, in the ways that they're both formed and formless, enigmatic in an artful way. Clouds expose the softer edges of dualities of light and shadow. Now, I may come to regret this because I'm afraid some of you may stop listening to what I have to say as you watch these images, but in much the same way that we showed the children images of clouds, we're going to scroll some of them on the screen over the next few minutes. <coughs> And I would love it if you might text me or jot down a note and put it in the offering plate of what you see in those clouds. 
I look forward to reading what you're seeing and I'll share my thoughts of what I saw in the next week in the good news. I'd love, I would love it if Clevelanders would learn to regard clouds in the same way that they're referred to in the Bible, as a natural and immediate sign of God's presence, promise, and glory. Perhaps one way that we might change our perspective is to accept the challenge of journalist Jan Brogan of the Boston Globe, who in her article entitled, Looking at the Night Sky Might Change Your Entire Point of View, suggests that we go out and check the sky at least once a day, if not more, and do this every day for three weeks. Brogan notes that in her 21 days, she moved from a sense of obligation to do this and just a sense of observation to something much more deeply resembling a spiritual experience. Perhaps we might make a similar journey by accepting that challenge. The rainbow, which is featured in our scripture reading today, is a particular kind of cloud phenomenon. It's iridescent. It appears when there is enough moisture in the sky to reflect the sunlight, but not enough to obscure it. And water droplets break up the white light of those clouds, and we can suddenly see all the colors in the visible spectrum. What is generally invisible for a brief moment becomes suddenly seen. In our text this morning, we follow the well-known story of Noah and the ark and the flood that God brings to destroy humanity because of the sinfulness of people. As Deborah shared, we tend to create this whole tale as a sweet children's story that we can use on felt boards with cute little animals marching in pairs onto the boat. But in reality, God is committing an act of premeditated destruction. And now he promises not to do it again. Thank God. The text shows some incarnational aspects of God that some people might find disconcerting. God regrets. God grieves. God remembers. I'm not sure we can all be comfortable with the idea that God needs a rainbow as a reminder, kind of like tying a string around the divine finger to recall never to destroy again. But this also shows that God has always desired relationship with all of humanity and is moved by the suffering that God's people experience. And notice that this covenant is not made just with Noah, but with every living creature, with all of creation. God's broad acceptance and unconditional love, God's inclusivity in this sign of the rainbow may be why it is such a beloved symbol of the LGBTQ community. I found it interesting as I was researching on this text that most commentators note that this covenant is unconditional, saying that all of the obligation rests with God God does all of the heavy lifting. But that just didn't really resonate well for me. And so I really appreciated it when I read United Church of Christ pastor and author David Cooper Ryder's point of view on the text, saying that a rainbow generally appears as half a circle and also as theologically half a symbol. It's God's pledge not to destroy means that God will take care of God's side of creation care. But this leaves us to complete the other side of the circle, doesn't it? And we have much to do 
to make that circle complete. God guarantees that the world will not be destroyed, but God can't guarantee that we won't destroy the world. We have to make our half of the rainbow so that we can all make sure that life on this planet has a future. And we can only do this if, to prevent the potential collapse of the planet, we dedicate ourselves to the success and livability of the Earth. We need to love the cosmos as much as God does and to commit to it as fully as God. We talk a lot about justice in the church, but I think that justice, ecological justice, is the biggest concern we face. Because if we don't change how we live and care for this gift of creation, the destruction of our planet is assured. And nothing else will matter if the planet comes to an end. If this might sound hyperbolic to you, maybe you haven't been paying attention to, for example, to the fact that current estimates of rising temperatures don't account for the reduction of cloud cover. But as the planet warms, it causes huge swaths of cloud to burn off, especially over the oceans, which sets up a warming feedback loop that puts global heating into overdrive. So what are we to do with such a vast, an overwhelming problem. How can we make a difference? First of all, I think we might commit to support the 2013 General Synod Resolution to make church buildings carbon neutral. And then, having committed to do that here, we could commit to do that same thing in our own homes. If you go to ucc.org and search on carbon neutral or climate justice churches, you will find a variety of tips and tools to use to consider. Interfaith Power and Light offers us a chance to calculate our carbon footprint, both in our churches and in our homes. And my hope is that we can work together with the Beg Committee and the Social Justice Ministry team to complete this calculator to consider what we might do to reduce our ecological impact. Some things may cost more money than we are ready to spend at this time, but many things can be free or quite inexpensive to do. And then I would love to see it take a, take a step further and ask each of all of us, our congregants, to do the same at home. Maybe we'd, we'll even consider starting a contest to see who can reduce their footprint by the most. Friends, I'm a bit embarrassed to tell you, but I'm going to come clean and let you know that I use this calculator to calculate my own carbon footprint, and I found myself to be a carbon villain, the highest category of carbon footprints. This despite my conviction for recycling. I drive my husband crazy because I haul home cans from whatever trip we're on until I can find a place to recycle them. We compost everything that we can and take it down to the compost bin at least two or three times a week. I drive my hybrid and have been doing so for more than a decade. But I fly too much. We own too big a home for what we need for two people. We need to walk more or ride our bikes use public transportation. We need to use less disposable plastic, eat less meat, and more seasonal and local vegetables and fruit. At the end of this calculator, when I face the fact that I am a global villain, a carbon villain, they give you a, an amount of money that you can contribute to help plant trees to offset your carbon footprint. Mine was $25 a month. That's a manageable amount of money to make a difference in the environment. It was an eye-opening experience. I'm looking for all the ways that I can reduce that footprint more and more. I hope you will too.
with less than eight months left to serve as the pastor of this church, I've begun looking daily at things that I would like to see happen before I leave so that the church is in the best possible place it can and make the biggest impacts we still have a chance to do over the time we have remaining. And friends, I think this, this concern for God's creation, this making a difference, this reminder of God's rainbow where God provides half, but we need to provide the other half of that circle may be the biggest, most important thing that we can do. Because I believe with all of my heart that God loves this planet and loves us unconditionally and wants us to join in this good environmental work, this stewardship of care. So what do you say? Shall we join on this journey? There's such a terrible consequence if our answer is no. Maybe we won't realize that in our lifetimes, but in our children's, and indeed in our grandchildren's, the consequence will come home. So my prayer is that we will all say yes. Amen. There's that quote about the arc of the moral universe taking its sweet old time to get turned in the direction of justice. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be a hopeful promise or a dire warning about the never-ending work of trying to right wrongs and end oppression. But when you think about what it takes to see a rainbow, the right circumstances, the right angles and distances, it does feel like something of a miracle, like old-timey Genesis stories with dark clouds rolled up on one side and light blue skies on the other. And spread between this arch in the vault of the skies, skies we have spent so much time looking at in wonder. We are told that it's a sign, a covenant that says a God who claims the right to vengeance will not deliver said vengeance as full destruction. Almost as if God, who sent the apocalyptic flood of Noah's time in the midst 
midst of grief over the evil inclinations of humans, was grieved even more about this retribution. Almost as if God learned that revenge doesn't cleanse the heart and annihilation doesn't atone for grief. The promise is for all people, all creatures, all life forever. A radical inclusivity against violence, even in judgment. And even though science says this covenant is an optical illusion, there is something here, too, for us to remember. That the spectrum of color made visible by refracted light always exists, is omnipresent in every beam of the sun through clouds, in the patches of warmth on the floor that bleed through our windows, in the reading glow of lamps, and the reflection of the sun on water. Whether or not we see God's promises in chromological order, or simply find peace in a blue sky puffed with white, we should remember the Ark of the Covenant of God to not seek destruction, no matter the justification. To challenge ourselves to keep bending toward restoration and to the same sweeping promise toward all life, however long it takes. We continue our time of prayer. Holy Creator, you are as vast as the sky, but as close as our breath, invisible like the air we breathe, and yet ever present. This day we give thanks for both the blue skies and the clouds that offer variation of color and intensity, while also carrying both necessary precipitation and the promise of rainbows. We give our praise and gratitude to you, gracious God, for the gift of your glorious creation and ask you to guide us in our efforts to be better stewards of this blessing. On this day of changeable skies, we cherish the gift of your presence in all times and in all circumstances. Surround us with your abiding love as we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our creator who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
What a wonderful world and what a wonderful day of beautiful music. Thanks so much to Harry's friend, Tim Schaefer, for coming and sharing with us his musical talents this morning. Tim, it's been a joy to have you here. Dick Berg is with us this morning to share a bit more about our Neighbors in Need offering. You received some information as you entered the sanctuary today. We'll be collecting that offering next week, and Dick will tell us a little bit about that. Actually, Vicki's sermon was probably the best advertisement for the Neighbors in Need offering, which we will be collecting on October 1st, because this year's theme of that special offering is environmental justice. As we know, plastics and electronics, other non-compostable waste are being tossed into our lakes and our rivers and our oceans, as well as even now being launched into space. And they're overflowing our landfills and corrupting our soil and our air. Such irresponsible action threatens our environment. It poses health hazards to all of us, is harmful to animals, and will have lasting effects into future generations. As people of faith, we believe these egregious acts are sinful and unholy. We have been loaned the earth and our environment, and we are stewards, and we are commanded by God to care for them and protect them. We can each do our own part to protect the environment, but on Sunday, October 1st, we'll be able to join with congregations all over the United Church of Christ to help environmental justice by giving generously to our neighbors in need special offering. So as we look at the changing colors of the trees, the cooler, fresh air, and the beauty of a sunset, please help protect them through your generous contributions. And I hope you have all picked up the brochure, which gives some information about what one church is doing and provides a prayer and a litany on the back for your use during this coming week. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that information. Please come prepared next week to share in this offering. And on this last week of our fiscal year, please give generously to fulfill your pledges to support the mission and ministry of this congregation as we receive this morning's offering with joy. Generous God, just as the work of your hands go into all the world and declare your glory, let these gifts from our hands go out into all the world and proclaim your goodness. May they bring justice and peace and safety and love to all those who are impacted by our ministries. Amen.
Go now, filled with a deep respect for what is at stake today if we don't commit to completing the rainbow, fulfilling our half of the covenant. Go knowing that while God's love is unconditional, our stewardship of creation is not just a trite phrase. Failure to act will have dire consequences. Go in peace, strengthened by the Spirit to do all we can to cherish and love this beautiful creation. Amen. <laughs>